Hey, Nate. Yes, Sam. Did you ever find yourself on like a moonless night staring up at the stars in the sky and wondering what else is out there? I have. And I also wonder, how would we know such a thing? I got a question about that. Welcome to the very first episode of Hey, I Got a Question About That. I'm Sam. I'm Nate. It's a podcast. It's a video. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and also on YouTube. And we're going to be talking about a lot of the cool research that goes on here at the Penn State Emberley College of Science. Yeah, in this episode, uh, we talked to Jason Wright, uh, he's Associate Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics here at Penn State. Uh, he studies stars, exoplanets, and he thinks a lot about if there's life out there and how we might find it. Right. We met Jason at the rooftop observatory on top of Davy Lab here in, here at the University Park campus. And we had a great wide-ranging conversation where we talked about biosignatures of life, Mars rocks on Earth, SETI, and alien megastructures. Yeah, it was really cool. Let's check it out. All right, so we're here at the rooftop observatory on Davy Lab on the Penn State campus with Jason Wright, who's an associate professor of astronomy and astrophysics at Penn State. Welcome, Jason. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Jason, why don't you tell us a little bit about your research? So I study stars. I think of myself as a stellar astronomer. But uh, what's really interesting about stars to a lot of people is they have planets going around them. And uh, so we study them and look for the motions of the stars that indicate that there's a planet in orbit around the star. And so we started by finding big, giant planets like the size of Jupiter or bigger around the nearest stars to Earth. But over the last uh, few years, through a lot of um, instrumental advances and the Kepler Space Telescope, we've started to find smaller and smaller planets. And that includes planets, rocky planets like the Earth. Uh, we haven't found one that we know is temperate that might have liquid water on it quite yet or that does have liquid water on it, but we have a lot of good candidates. And so a lot of the work I do is about finding the very closest Earth-like planets to the solar system so that we can follow up and see if maybe they have life on them. Right, so this brings us to, you know, kind of what we're interested in here is, is there life out there? And kind of more importantly, how would we know? And what, what kind of evidence are we, do we, can we use to kind of determine if there is life on other planets? Yeah, we'd love to know our place in the universe. There's hundreds of billions of planets just in our galaxy. There's hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. It seems unlikely that Earth would be the only one that had life or that had intelligent life like us. Um, so we assume that they're, they must be out there. Um, the question is, how would, we, how would we know exactly? So we don't know if life is an inevitable consequence of having liquid water on the surface of a planet like the Earth. One way to check for that is in the solar system. There's liquid water uh, either in the past or currently uh, throughout the solar system. Mars is the most famous example. It almost certainly had liquid water on its surface billions of years ago. So. If that meant it had life, then maybe we can find some sort of fossilized bacteria or something like that in the subsurface of Mars. Or maybe in the oceans of the icy moons of the outer planets, like Enceladus or Europa is a favorite. Uh, maybe we can go underneath the ice and see if there's you know, European fish or something swimming around or whatever their equivalent is. Um, and so if we found that, that would indicate that life is pretty much an inevitable consequence of water. And then we'd expect to find it around almost every planet like the Earth or every moon like Europa, everywhere in the galaxy. On the other hand, um, it's possible we'll go there and those are just completely sterile worlds. It could be that uh, abiogenesis, the creation of life uh, at the very beginning, is a very rare event. And that we're going to have to check hundreds or thousands of planets before we find another one that has life on it like Earth does. And uh, if that's the case, it's going to be pretty challenging. It's hard enough to even find these rocky planets around nearby stars. To tell that they maybe have algae on them or something seems at first blush totally impossible. But um, we have some pretty good ideas. And the reason is that life has a big effect on the planet. Earth's atmosphere is completely different because of its biosphere, because of life on Earth. Um, oxygen in Earth's atmosphere is only there because of aerobic activity of life all across its surface. So the hope is that if we can find the atmospheres of these planets, we can check what gases are in the atmospheres and see if they're the sorts of chemical mixtures that only come about from metabolism. And then we'll be able to say, all right, there we got one. That planet there has some kind of life on it. So since Mars is so close, isn't there fear of cross-contamination? 
Right, so if we do find life on Europa or on Mars or something like that, and we check it out and it's got DNA, it could mean, oh great, you know, whenever life forms it has DNA. But it could also mean that it's actually got the same origin as life on Earth. So surprisingly, if, if something big impacts a planet, like the, the killer asteroid that killed off all the dinosaurs, it turns out that there are rocks that get thrown up by an impact like that that actually survive into space. And if there's uh, bacteria in those rocks, and, and there are a lot of living things that live inside of rocks, um, that they could just hitch a ride on that rock. And we know that there are rocks that make it to other planets. So there are Mars rocks on Earth. Like people have picked up meteorites and they came from Mars. So it's possible that Earth life started on Mars and then hitched a ride to Earth. And so if we found life on Mars, it wouldn't mean it started neither. Actually, the work on that, that surprising result that rocks can transfer from impacts like that, um, a lot of that work was done here at, here at Penn State uh, to see. And so we think that there, there are Earth rocks on Europa, for instance. Wow. So again, if we found life on Europa, that could mean that it was actually Earth life that just found its way over there. Or vice versa, right? I mean, it... Either way, we don't, that's right. So it's possible. It's, yeah, it's probably far-fetched, but it's right. possible. On the other hand, if the Mars life doesn't use DNA, it's some completely different way of encoding genetic information, uh, that is more evidence that it's a unique Genesis, uh, or, or you know, I guess life could have started twice on Earth and only one survived, or something. But for the most part, that would that would be pretty conclusive. So I could be an alien. We could all be aliens. That's right. Yeah, from another planet, billions of years ago. So, <clears throat> also be because Mars and Europa are close things, you know, we can send probes to them and and bring back samples and do that kind of thing. What about stuff that's further afield? You know, the next nearest star is right. what four billion four. Four light, light years yeah, away. Four light years away. It takes light four years to get there. We can't go anything like the speed of light, so it would take us a lot longer to get there. That's right. Um, with Mars, we can contemplate sample return. If we could launch a rocket off of Mars after landing it, we could bring stuff back. Or we could send you know, microscopes to Mars and actually have robots or something examine the rocks and look for those fossils. Uh, and people talk about submarines on Europa or submarines on Enceladus or something like that. But when it comes to the other, other stars, it's really, really hard. There is a project called Breakthrough Starshot that contemplates a massive laser array that could launch a tiny little chip, just like that big, all the way to the very nearest star. But that's not going to do anything like land on a planet. At best, it'll take a really crummy picture of the planet, which would be amazing, but it's not a way to, to, to find life. So, and you mentioned like specific um, things in the environment of a planet that has that has life on it, like our, our atmosphere here on Earth, if, and detecting that in exoplanets, how, how can you tell what's in the atmosphere of an exoplanet? Right, so if we want to know if there's life on another planet, we have to look for some signature. And so the jargon term is biosignature. We look for a signature, uh, some, something about the planet that could only be due to biological activity on that planet. So the ones we think about most commonly are atmospheric signatures. If the planet uh, happens to pass between its host star and the Earth, uh, then every time it goes around the star, it'll block a little bit of the starlight, and so the star will get a bit dimmer. But some of that light won't just go past the planet or hit the planet, but will filter through the planet's atmosphere on its way to Earth. And uh, if you have an atmosphere that's filled with oxygen, oxygen absorbs specific colors or wavelengths of light preferentially. And so the light that filters through the atmosphere will be missing those colors. And so the idea is that we would look at, at just the light that filtered through the atmosphere during one of these, these uh, transit events, they're called, and see if, it, if the, the missing colors correspond to, for instance, oxygen or methane or something like that. And then ask ourselves, is there a way that that combination of gases, like oxygen and methane, could possibly exist together in the same atmosphere unless there was metabolism or something maintaining that? Because those are two gases that should not exist in the same atmosphere. Uh, and the only reason we have a lot of oxygen and a lot of methane in our atmosphere is because of the uh, metabolic activities of creatures on Earth. All this kind of is, is based on our bias of what we know about life here on Earth. Is there ideas about finding stuff that might be completely different? 
Yeah, part of the difficulty of looking for something when you're not sure exactly what it is is that you don't know exactly how to look. So the, the best starting point for looking for life in the galaxy is to look for life as we know it, because we know life as we know it does have certain effects. So when I said we might look for oxygen and methane in the same atmosphere, that's a very Earth-centric perspective on the sorts of things certain kinds of Earth-based life would do to their atmosphere. So we can try to be a little more generic and look for any kinds of gases in the atmosphere that shouldn't be there together. Because as you say, maybe life as we don't know it doesn't use carbon and oxygen, but uses other combinations of gases. Uh, and so we have to be ready to be surprised. We have to be ready to see stuff that doesn't make any sense and just ask ourselves, is there any way that that could be without some kind of biological process going on on the planet? Why is your research important to just the average person? Well, I think we all want to understand, you know, why we're here and, and how we fit into the bigger picture of things. I think everyone's looked up at the sky and, you know, wondered how far it goes or how many stars or if there are, if there's other life out there. I mean, all through science fiction, we've got stories of, you know, aliens out there that might be like us in certain ways or not in other ways. In some ways, the question of whether we're alone in the universe is one of the oldest and most profound questions that has been asked. And it's pretty amazing that science is at the point where we might actually be able to answer it. We're at, the, we're at a turning point where we're capable of discovering other life elsewhere in the universe. And that's pretty amazing. If you have a budget like the original Star Trek series, they all are going to look very much like us. That's right. They'll all just be like us, except they'll have little bumps on their foreheads. And that's how you know they're aliens. That's, right. that's probably not what we'll find, I suspect. <laughs> so, you know, is this pursuit something that is worth spending whatever it costs to, to look for it? Is, is it a justification in itself, or is there kind of additional things that we're also learning about the, the universe that, that help to justify it? Yeah, I think all of astronomy is just so fascinating. Everyone, you know, loves the pictures that come down from Hubble and, you know, we all, it, it's, astronomy is a field that I think everybody can relate to in terms of the wonder of the sky and just understanding the whole universe. So I think it, it's clear that astronomy deserves, you know, some share of the, the, the national science budget. Uh, and there's plenty of spin-offs that come from it as well. And so, uh, we know that when we go looking for just understanding the universe, we'll learn things that actually do end up helping us on Earth. Um, and so given that that's what we're doing, yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense that we're spending some fraction of the astronomy budget looking for life as you know, the thing that we're after. And I'm sure we'll find a lot of things along the way. And that's reflected in, in NASA's budget and the National Science Foundation's budget, that they have a, a decent fraction of their astronomy and planetary science budget set aside uh, for what's called astrobiology or exobiology, the study of life in the universe. And that includes us. If life finds us, do you think we should be afraid of it? If life finds us, should we be afraid of it? Uh, I don't know what's going to happen if life finds us. If life finds us, that probably implies that we're talking about intelligent life. Yes. And that they've like detected our radio waves or something. They're watching I Love Lucy or something from those old radio broadcasts or television broadcasts from decades ago. Maybe they've um, seen Carl Sagan kissing his wife. There we go. <laughs> uh, right. And we've sent out, yeah, we've sent out these signals, some of them deliberately to try and get get the attention of anyone that might be out there. Space is really vast. I mean, we were, it would just, it, it would take so long to travel among the stars um, that I, I, I think it's unlikely that anything we've done in the last few decades could trigger a visit unless there's something, someone very nearby that just said, oh my gosh, what's that? And it came right over. Um, uh, when we talk about visiting nearby stars, we're usually talking about trips of tens of thousands of years. Maybe you can send tiny things in, in, in decades or something. I think it's extremely unlikely that our activities will have attracted attention to trigger a visit uh, just because the space is so vast. Now, you know, maybe there really is warp drive. Maybe it's more than a contrivance to make science fiction more interesting because it'd be awfully boring if it was just a 10,000 year voyage. Um, but uh, it, it would not surprise me at all if there was no possible way to do warp drive. We're all stuck below the speed of light. That is the best physics we know, and it seems pretty inviolate. So actually getting visited by an alien species seems very unlikely, but finding some sort of transmission that they've sent off or, or some sort of evidence that they're there 
And by they, I don't just mean, you know, the algae on a rock somewhere, but an actual intelligent technological species that can make transmissions. That does seem feasible because we are transmitting radio signals that we would be able to detect if we were you know, out near the, the very closest stars to Earth. That's what SETI does, right? Right, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. You, it might better be called the search for extraterrestrial technology. And it was really born when people made this realization that our most powerful radars could send signals to space so powerful that our most powerful telescopes could detect them. So that is worth looking for. It's possible that there are many technological species out there and there are a lot of things that they could do that would seem obviously artificial. The most obvious would be some sort of radio transmission that looks like ours. But again, that's sort of like saying we're looking for life as we know it. They're, they will probably have technology as we don't know it. But that doesn't mean it won't be artif obviously artificial. So a lot of uh, SETI is not just looking for radio transmissions, but other things maybe laser transmissions or looking for signs of industry or looking at alien planets, atmospheres, and seeing not carbon and methane, but seeing synthesized chemicals, things that cannot occur in nature, like chlorofluorocarbons or something like that. So uh, another possibility is we should be ready to consider that they might have been around with technology for billions of years. And if you, you know, give a species like us billions of years to figure out lots of physics and engineering to you know, build machines that can build machines and go into space, given enough time, uh, it's reasonable that you might expect enormous structures. I mean, humanity has built things like the Great Wall of China or the Great Pyramids or skyscrapers that are just absolutely enormous compared to what one person can do with their hands. Um, give us a million years, maybe we'll be able to build planet-sized solar panels. Or maybe, you know, just like we, we spread across the planet and pollute the planet with stuff, we'll spread across the solar system and have solar panels all over the place. Right, we've only been around for, what, less, like around 100,000 years or something well, like that? Well, right, humanity has only been technological, really, for thousands of years. Right. So give us enough time and, and maybe we will cause changes in the solar system that are as dramatic and obvious as the changes we've caused here on Earth. So uh, one way to go looking for something like that was suggested by Freeman Dyson in 1960, which is that an alien species might build structures so large that they would actually block most of a star's light from coming out, perhaps because they're harnessing all that energy to do whatever it is billion-year-old technological species do. But whatever they do, they're going to block that light. And so you might see one of those structures pass in front of a star, make it dimmer. You might see the, the, the waste heat that they have to give off because they can't keep the energy or destroy it. They have to let it go eventually. When they let it go, it'll come out as, as thermal radiation. And so we can look for stars that have too much thermal radiation coming off of them. And so that's another way we go about looking for, for alien technology. We look for alien industry. So that was cool. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to hear that, you know, how they're looking for signs of life on these planets versus life itself. Right, and it was kind of amazing to hear about some of the different tools and techniques that astronomers are using to find that life. And Jason Wright was amazing. He was so knowledgeable. I actually follow him on Twitter, and he posts a lot of his research uh, on there, and it's a really good feed. It's uh, at Astro underscore Wright. That's cool. Um, so we'll have links to his Twitter feed and to his uh, research page, as well as links to uh, where you can get information about the Everly College of Science and all the rest of the research that we do here in the description to the podcast below. So that's it. We did it. We made a thing. The first episode of Hey, I Got a Question About That is in the books, and if I do say so myself, it was excellent. Uh, I think we set the bar pretty high for our next episode. <laughs> That's true, but there's so many questions and so many great researchers here at Penn State, and we're going to be delving into those in future episodes. Yeah, so thanks for watching, and we will see you next time. Bye. We have our first outtake. I'm yeah. sure it won't be the last. If you stop stumbling. <laughs> <laughs> what? What am I asking? I don't even remember what you asked. So since Mars and Europa are so close, so since Mars and Europa are... Why can I not say Europa? So since Mars and Europa are so... I'm just going to say Mars. That's why I stay behind the camera. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're way better at this than we are. <laughs> so we need to like... Spoon. No, this is falling apart already. Hello.
Hello. Welcome to the very first episode of, hey, I got a question about that. It's a podcast. It, <laughs> <laughs> this is super hard, but it shouldn't be. Podcasting is hard. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I can hear your beard. <laughs> that is kind of crazy. It's science, science, science. Science.